Good morning, everyone. I'm Thor Pritchard, your moderator for today's webinar. This is an exciting time for higher education. New technologies are provoking change in policies and practices in lecture halls and classrooms around the country, if not around the world. More people today are gaining access to some form of higher education than in any other time in recorded history. There are renewed debates about the role of higher education in society, technology, and its purpose in academia, and in the well value of a <clears throat> well-rounded little arts education in later life. Adobe Education is adding its voice to this conversation through this webinar series featuring thought leaders of diverse perspectives taking, talking about different ways technology is being used to enhance academia and prepare students for the creative economy of the future. Stay tuned to the Adobe Education Exchange for announcements of dates and speakers for these upcoming topics. With us today is Jan Runhol Liebig. He is an Associate Professor of Professional Communication and Rhetoric in the College of Architecture, Arts, and Humanities at Clemson University. He serves as co-director of the Center for Excellence in Next Generation Computing and Creativity. He will share with us how ubiquitous mobile devices, laptops, phones, tablets, even watches, are transforming teaching and learning in higher education. Jan, welcome. Hello, and thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, I'm going to get my presentation going here, so bear with me for a second. Okay, um, I want to thank everybody for joining this morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here on the Adobe webinar. Uh, my uh, presentation is uh, titled Creatively Mobile, and I'll be giving the um, paper uh, for about uh, 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll do questions afterwards. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Traditionally, creativity through digital media has been the domain of fields such as graphic communication, journalism, and the arts. I believe, however, that digital creativity can be a powerful force for learning and innovation across the entire curriculum. By bringing digital creativity to non-traditional creativity areas, English, technical communication, and digital rhetoric, which I will be discussing here, we are augmenting our students' critical thinking skills with the kind of creative invention that drives the most successful high-tech industries today. When critical thinking meets creative thinking, smart innovation can occur. I call this being creatively mobile. In this talk, I will discuss how creativity can generate forward mobility in three specific domains of the educational endeavor. Personal mobility, professional mobility, and disciplinary mobility. Personal mobility refers to the individual's opportunities to have new and meaningful learning experiences through personalized mobile courses enabled by digital creativity technology. Professional mobility refers to the student's opportunity to develop new insights and knowledge within their chosen profession while at the same time gaining valuable skills and literacy to help them better succeed in the digital economy. Disciplinary mobility refers to the student's agency in helping to move their profession forward, both in terms of knowledge production and the methods or practice for producing the knowledge. I will return to each of these mobilities in turn highlighting how digital creativity is utilized to achieve positive mobility in three different college courses at Princeton University. These courses serve as examples of how digital creativity is seamlessly integrated into non-traditional creativity curriculum in a way that is designed to produce creatively mobile students. Educational scholars such as James Paul G. and others contend that every student today ought to be a maker. Learning should be augmented by and reinforced through the process of making. Creativity is sometimes defined as a process by which something new and presumably valuable is brought into being. It is often used to describe what artists do. But if we look at the root of the word, to create, we can see that it can also be used to characterize the process of creation more broadly. Thus, I contend that while you have to be a creative to be an artist, you do not have to be an artist to be creative. Creativity, thus, is a skill that can be learned and therefore should also be taught. At the Center of Excellence at Clemson University, we believe 
that technologies, uh, creativity technologies, will be just as essential to the creatively mobile student of the future as traditional productivity software is today. Computer scientist Alan Kay in 1971 said that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So we decided to invent it. In 2014, Clemson University's IT organization under the visionary leadership of then CIO Jim Bottom took the unprecedented step of providing Adobe Creative Cloud to every student, faculty, and staff. Since then, in all of my classes, I have students use this industry-leading software to explore and understand both theoretical and practical concepts using creativity to make digital response artifacts. Traditionally, such artifacts would be written papers. My students still produce a significant amount of writing, but they now also create graphics, videos, and even video games that respond to and reflect upon what they are learning. I teach software skills only in the context of the problems that I'm asking my students to solve. The skills training is fully embedded into the learning process and carefully scaffolded to fit the thematic progression of the course. In my online technical communication course, uh, which is an undergraduate general education offering, um, as a course that is primarily designed for STEM students, um, I'm giving the millennial students uh, ground up um, personalized and fully mobile course experience. The readings are available in digital form, and every assignment can be completed on a mobile device. The ambition is to give the students an opportunity to study on their own terms anywhere and any place. The coursework focuses on identifying and responding to a communication challenge, or what we call a rhetorical situation that has significance to them. The students will develop a communications campaign utilizing the classical Aristotelian principles of pathos, logos, and ethos to solve the problem rhetorically. Because this is an online course with rather limited opportunities for hands-on technical support, I'm having them use the entry-level Adobe Spark suite of tools to produce the digital response artifact. The first artifact is a series of Spark post graphics that appeal to pathos, that is, emotion to persuade viewers to take an interest in the problem the student wishes to communicate. The second artifact is a web page story that presents more detailed information um, through appeals to logos, that is, logic, in order to convince readers that the problem is real and needs a solution. Finally, they create a spark video movie that aims to convince their audience to take the prescribed action based on the author's ethos, that is, their credibility as a communicator. In this course, the students have a unique learning experience that not only teaches them about the rhetoric of technical communication, but also one that is designed with personal mobility in mind. Professional mobility concerns the development of knowledge and skills that the student needs to become a professional, successful professional in their chosen career. Connecting theoretical knowledge with practical skills does not only express that knowledge, but also, more importantly, allow you to use it for creative inventional purposes, both inside and outside of the classroom. It's something that is often overlooked but that I nevertheless care deeply about. In my Upper Division Capstone Seminar on Transmedia for English Majors, we explore storytelling across the street media, using popular IPs like The Walking Dead and Game of Thrones as the inspiration. My students uh, begin their exploration of the topic by writing short original stories. They then turn these stories into comics using Creative Cloud tools, such as Adobe Illustrator, Photoshop, and Lightroom. After that, they turn the comics into short films using Adobe Premiere Pro and After Effects. Here are some examples of the student work 
um, that was produced for this course. With regard to assessment of learning outcomes, I look for general improvement from start to finish. Does the work show that the student's knowledge has evolved? Can I compare the timeline in an initial Premier Pro video project to a final one to look for increased sophistication? Mainly, though, I review to see if the student is capable of transmediating a story from medium to medium, from text to comics to video, and back sometimes. Did the student simply retell the story in the same way across all media? Or did he or she use the power of cinematic to add new elements to the video version compared to the text version? The underlying ambition to promote professional mobility in the students is achieved by making the connections between theory and practice relevant and readily observable through deeply integrated use of digital creativity throughout. After taking this course, the graduating seniors had not only learned about one of today's most popular storytelling phenomena, they have also gained practical experience with transmediation, as well as valuable practical skills um, with industry-leading digital storytelling tools. In one example, uh, Megan Glass, an undergraduate student from my transmedia course, created an amazing video project with Premiere Pro. She had never used this tool before, um, but she told me afterwards that she realized she now had the potential to become a professional video producer. This was a career option she hadn't previously considered. So by giving her the opportunity to learn and practice creative skills using professional tools, this course opened up new horizons and opportunities for her. She became professionally mobile. Disciplinary mobility is primarily concerned with graduate students. They represent the next generation of scholars and researchers, and they need to be trained with disciplinary mobility in mind. That is to say, their education must include invention of new knowledge as an underlying ambition. To accomplish this, I have developed a pedagogy called creative heuristics, which acts as a Greek muse for learning through the act of invention. My digital rhetoric seminar in the Rhetoric Communication and Information Design PhD program at Clemson University, students are asked to process theoretical knowledge through the act of invention. The basic premise for this pedagogical approach is that students begin with something that is known, in the case of text or a theory, or another learning artifact from the syllabus. Then the student interprets this across something that is unknown. This is the creative, creative heuristic that changes week by week. The goal of the exercise is to invent something that is new that can produce new insights and understanding on the known. In the RCID Digital Rhetoric Seminar, the act of production involves using creative cloud tools, including Adobe Lightroom and Premiere Pro specifically. In this manner, students are also afforded a unique opportunity to acquire important digital literacy and skills that will help make them more successful on the job market and hopefully in their future academic careers, whether it be academia or industry. It is important to note here that unlike some certification-based approaches to technical training, skill acquisition in the context of this course is a byproduct of the creative process. Tool mastery is fully integrated into the aspect of learning. The process emphasizes just-in-time principles for when new tools and techniques are introduced. Professor Gregory Ulmer, a rhetorician and new media theorist at the University of Florida, calls this iterative learning by doing process heuretic. It resembles in many ways how proponents of the maker movement think about learning. The PhD students in my digital rhetoric seminar do extensive readings of rhetorical text. Instead of writing papers to analyze the work, however, they now use creative cloud tools to create digital artifacts that demonstrate their understanding. To get them started, 
I provide, as I said, a heuristic as a spark to inspire their creativity. For example, after they read Camera Lucida by Roland Barthes one week, I asked them to use the word spin as a heuristic to ignite the process of thinking about the text and creating a digital artifact in response. Another week to create a heuristic was the word threshold. When I evaluate their work, I'll look for how well they're able to articulate the essence of that theoretical work in their response pieces and doing so visually. Do they do a good job of communicating their understanding multimodally through their digital artifacts? For example, is their visual storytelling so strong that they can get the message across with only video and no sound? Further, at the graduate level, I also look for evidence of invention and innovation. These students, as I mentioned, are studying to be scholars, and their future job will be to produce new knowledge through research. I have found digital creativity to be a great way to generate such new insights, not only new and nicer presentations of existing knowledge. Using the creative heuristic pedagogy, these graduate students gain extensive practice in the process of rhetorical invention. And by the end, they will have acquired a solid platform from which to affect positive disciplinary mobility within their areas of research. A question that often comes up when I discuss digital creativity is how do you assess the creative work? Let me therefore say a few words about that. First of all, I believe that you cannot be creative inside of a rigid rubric. The learning methodology that I'm discussing here, therefore, lies in what I've termed a fail-fast pedagogy. In many areas of the computer industry and elsewhere, fail-fast has been practiced for many years. In education, we have yet to recognize, I believe, the critical link between failure and invention. You cannot be a successful inventor if you're also not prepared to fail. And more importantly, learn from those failures. Our education system that is focused on assessment and grades is set up to punish failure. This leads to risk aversion in the students, which is something that ultimately stifles innovation. We want to encourage innovation in invention and learning. To achieve this, therefore, I believe that we must augment traditional rubrics for assessment with a learning style that incorporates failure as a heuristic process. That is to say, a process that embraces invention as its ultimate outcome. The students should not be afraid of being punished with bad grades if they are creative and inventive in their problem solving. Instead, they should be encouraged to explore problems in creative ways that emphasize the larger end goal, which is invention of new knowledge, skills, and learning artifacts. The creative heuristic is meant to inspire the students to think to think critically about a problem and invent a solution or respond to that problem by applying creative thinking and practice. When you're dealing with invention, there is no right answer to the problem. Coming up with a question that frames the problem and provides insight into its nature is just as important from a heuristic learning point of view as inventing the solution for it. The creative heuristic encourages a learning process that acknowledges failure as part of the price that must be paid for real innovation, invention and innovation. Assessment of the process and the product should emphasize evolution and sophistication and the innovative aspects of the product, the product as a whole, rather than graded judgment of the discrete steps taken toward the overall learning outcome. To encourage the students with exploratory efforts, I carefully scaffold the technology so they start with smaller projects and build to more complex ones. I use the fail-fast pedagogy to allow them to quickly learn from their mistakes. At the outset of a course, I'm therefore not as concerned about rubrics and grading because I don't want to stifle their creativity. Instead, I set them up for success by allowing them to experiment fail, learn, and move on. It is an iterative process that emphasizes learning by doing, 
And this can be a challenge to embrace in academia, but it really shows promise and it allows the uh, creative process to unfold. Digital literacies involve much more than just learning how to use digital technology. In all my courses, I want students to become more proficient digital communicators and creators so they're better equipped to succeed in the many aspects that their lives demand. By integrating digital media making into the coursework and giving the students an opportunity to put practice and the theories they're learning, put into practice the theory they're learning, and to develop a love of crafting a story and seeing it come alive in different forms. My students discover that creativity is a skill that they can learn, even if they're not artists. They take pride in the work that they do and they begin to see new possibilities for their own futures. When it comes to bringing digital media creation into your coursework, it is helpful to remember that technology should have a larger purpose than itself. Within higher education, specifically in the humanities and the arts, we're not as focused on technology itself because the tools always change and evolve. Still, it's valuable to give students training in the technologies that are used throughout the workforce. And by working with these tools, students learn to adapt and gain confidence that they can pick up any technology that is presented to them in the future. When you make professional tools like Creative Cloud software available to your students, you can plan more advanced coursework. You're not struggling with the limits of consumer-grade software. You don't have to ask students to buy $500 worth of software every year or so. And you don't have students working on a range of different platforms that all have different capabilities. For the professor, this is a huge benefit. For the students, it can sometimes mean not having to choose between buying the textbook or the software because they cannot afford both. Adobe offers a range of solutions for teaching of digital literacy to digital natives. Professors who are interested in exploring these opportunities can start with the free entry-level tools like Adobe Spark and the many mobile apps that are now available for both iOS and Android. If the full Creative Cloud is available, even more exciting opportunities open up. For one thing, as a professor, I now have the tools with which to create all of my own course videos, an undertaking that would previously require a massive production investment. Both professors and students can join the Adobe Education Exchange to access free professional development and learning resources. Finally, Creative Cloud offers some invaluable services by showcasing work. Since 2014, I have used Adobe's Behance platform exclusively to post my course videos and sample on my work and the work that my students do. I have them share and showcase their projects on Behance as well. Behance allows students to gain more exposure for their work and get feedback from a worldwide creative community. This raises the stakes quite a bit, but it means they are posting their projects to show future employers and the world what they can do with digital media. Bringing digital media making into your core academic classes takes some thought and effort, but the benefits can be tremendous. Not only will your students learn digital literacy skills that will serve them well in their career, they will also develop the creative mindset needed to make meaningful change in their lives, their communities, and the world at large. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. That's a fantastic presentation. I've got a, a couple of great questions that have inspired uh, for me that I wanted to ask you about this, because this is an interesting uh, transition we're seeing in higher education, say in K-12, this idea of um, uh, the electricity, I, I think I pronounced yeah. that right, I've never pronounced it actually, um, uh, of the idea that you know, Gregory Ulmer sort of put out, you know, put out of that, you know, electricity, electricity is like, it's to digital media as literacy is to print. And this idea of the uh, skills and abilities of mastering those, not just the technology, but the ways to use different media um, is really profound. And that, that's a, 
different kind of learning that we haven't really ever experimented with, right? Right. Um, what uh, this is an important distinction, and I think we have to make right at the outset is that um, when we talk about digital literacy, we need to take into account that it's more than just the ability to uh, uh, to master the tools. And and I like to say, you know, if you look at literacy uh, narrowly, you say literacy is about reading and writing and knowing how to read and write, but knowing how to read and write is really only the beginning. You, you can you can write a great poem or a novel if you if you only know how to read and write. You have to know something about uh, literature and how you know poetry and you have to have some experiences to go beyond just the mastery of the skill and that's where I think uh, this uh, electricity is uh, important to think about and some people call it digital fluency. It means that um, students uh, must be trained to see uh, these technologies as more than just tools to achieve. And then they are, in fact, uh, opportunities that uh, are waiting to be unlocked. And having uh, a broader understanding of what these tools um, or enablers can do for you is, is important, very important. Yeah. Well, let me also sort of play the devil's advocate because I, I, my sense is that a lot of folks would also feel like, well, how do you how do you ensure that there's the richness of learning or that analysis? For example, if you're doing uh, you know, literature analysis, you're doing sort of that the, the traditional sort of aspects of what would occur in college where you're doing a lot of papers, you're doing analysis, et cetera. How do you ensure that there's that there's almost a legitimacy question, right? Of, well, is digital media the same and it has equivalency? Does it have the same completeness and robustness as, say, a written analysis? How do you have evidence of that, that it's as thorough or that the students are grasping the same nuanced details in a, uh, you know, a transmedia, multimedia type environment versus a traditional, I'll put that in quotes, uh, written experience? How do you, uh, you know, speak to that, you might hear? So this this is something that comes up because we are um, conditioned to privilege print and um, traditional literacy yeah. over any new forms of literacy, such as digital literacy and uh, new mediums, who uh, are always uh, generally uh, ranked up against the almighty uh, print medium. We all know. <laughs> right. Um, I want to you know, just invoke one of my my, one of my um, uh, heroes, uh, Marshall McLuhan, uh, Canadian media theorist in the 1950s and 60s, who's famous for and coined the term the medium. <clears throat> the medium is the message, meaning that um, the medium itself, when we need to look at a new medium, we need to disconnect what that medium can do from whatever we happen to say in it at any given time. So what it means the digital world is that um, with the with everything that we now have at our disposal, we need to be looking at what new what new inventions can come about uh, in this in these uh, new uh, with these new opportunities, rather than try to continue the practices that we have honed from the print um, the print world. In other words, are we going to take advantage of or try to explore and figure out what this new digital medium can do for us, or are we just going to use it as a way of uh, mediating the same um, the same messages that we have uh, done up until now? And I think the answer is clear. Uh, and for our students, uh, the goal is to uh, use this new medium and learn uh, what it can do to help move uh, them forward, be mobile, help uh, make the world a better place at the end of the day. Yeah, no, and I, and I also like the point of the example you were talking about in terms of the pedagogy for like the transmedia class where you would have folks start with maybe perhaps a print piece and how to, you know, migrate it in a way or, or reinvent or reinterpret it in a visual piece or an auditory piece or video, for example. And, and the fact you mentioned also that transmedia isn't just a one direction from print but it can be going from any of these media to any others. And I thought that was a really interesting strategy, especially for those, those naysayers, you know, that, that are out there saying, well, 
print is supreme uh, or print is the only way we know for sure. And I think the strategy is as well, if they can still go between any, any media, between print, audio, video, et cetera, and back again, that's a really interesting argument in terms of, well, if they can take, say, uh, some independent film or some artistic film that they've seen and reinterpret that back into print and recreate that understanding and nuance in a print environment just as well as it was done in a video, that says a lot about that student's uh, mastery of that and of understanding media and what the message is. Right. Are. Right. Um, and and, and the, the thing with uh, print is that it, it, it is uh, very, very resilient and it is alive and well and it's not going anywhere. I, I think people have a tendency okay. often to sort of when something new is on the horizon, you kind of get worried about losing what you have. I, I, I feel like that's certainly not going to happen. In fact, if you look at the production of text, uh, I think we produce, we produce more text today than ever before in human history. So, I mean, text is alive and well, and, and, and I'm not necessarily worried about that and what's going to happen to mm -hmm. it. Um, I, I feel like text has very clear strengths and very, um, uh, you know, and, and as a medium, it, it allows you to um, very concisely uh, communicate in, um, in a very low, uh, cost way and that, you know, communicate in text is very inexpensive uh, as, opposed, as opposed to most other digital technologies which require more medium in order to facilitate communication yeah. and that can get expensive both in terms of cost but in terms of training on skills uh, for the communicators. So, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, transmediation is a very interesting concept that uh, I found to be perfect uh, topic to um, in, in include training in the technologies uh, themselves and give the students the experience of transmediating so that they understand that you know each medium will add its own strengths and each medium also has its own weaknesses and so when, if you have a story uh, that uh, you want to uh, tell and you have uh, different media, then um, you should uh, have some experience with those media to take better advantage of their strengths and avoid their weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great point. Yeah. Looks like we got one question here from one of our attendees. Uh, Jeff asks, do faculty believe that introducing design, invention, and creativity into their courses distract students from the content? Um, yeah. So what's been your question? Thank your you. Um, it, my short answer to that is I think invention, design, and creativity uh, is what uh, augments or, or help us better understand that content, to get at the content in a, in a, in a more uh, holistic way, uh, one in, in a way that perhaps can uh, lead us to better, deeper understanding of what that content is. In other words, um, if we continue to look at a problem from the same angle all the time, we are not necessarily going to see other new forms of solution. So by changing our perspective and our point of view on that content through uh, things like design, invention, and creativity, uh, maybe we can uh, start to uh, think about the, the problems we have in new ways and come up with uh, better solutions. And there are some big problems that we're faced with in the world today that really uh, scream out for, for new ways of thinking about them. And um, Albert Einstein, for one, is uh, known to have said that you cannot really solve the problems using the same kind of thinking that uh, we used when we created them. And this is kind of where it all comes back to. Is I, the, the need, I think, for refocusing, realigning our educational uh, system to the real world problems or the problems that are that are facing us today. Yeah, that's a great point because one of the things we always think about is, you know, if we're just using technology to teach the same way we've always taught, we're not really furthering the, the advancement of the profession or of the experience. And if instead we use digital media and use digital tools to teach in ways we could never have imagined prior to that or that were never made possible prior to those digital tools, just to imagine what kinds of new ways of learning and new ways of interacting and understanding can come about if we're going about it in a different way. Right. 
how much how much do you find that faculty need support from that? You know, is there an element of understanding how much pedagogy is is so much more important in, in digital media because it's not just you teach the same way you always taught. You have different modalities. You have different outputs, right? And how much does it take for uh, universities to embrace that and make that kind of leap of faith to somewhat uh, case or just a transition and making it more of a uh, like you said that iterative learning process um, yeah that's not something that we're going to solve overnight um, and I like to in, in this kind of question comes up I like to you know point to the fact that you know literacy that we know it today has taken over 2,000 mm. years to evolve and develop so um, the the question you raise is um, I, and, and, and again, people come back and say, well, do you see any return on the investment with Creative Cloud? And I said, it's way, way, way too early to even think about that because we're, we're enabling something that uh, has not been done across the curriculum before uh, in, in a, on a broad scale. And so it's going to take, it's gonna take uh, time. And I, I don't have a, a timeline for when I can start to say this is people are getting it. But what I do know is that I, uh, I um, focus a lot of my efforts on the graduate students, namely the PhD students and the master's students who will be um, teachers themselves and who are in fact also teachers, VTAs, while they're here. Um, they are generally more uh, receptive to uh, use of technology. They're not concerned about learning new technologies, they, they, a lot of them uh, know a lot before they even come in. And um, mm -hmm. the, the question from Chuck here is also, I can yeah. tie this into, into this, um, as I said, to, before, you, before you can productively use or learn how to use the technology, you need to have a motivation for doing so. Um, so what I, do, what I do is I post or help students pose the problems that they want to solve and then we introduce the technology on the back end of that as the solution as one way you can work towards the solution using the tools. So um, when I do spend class time I, I I create I have class time as integrated into the, the teaching of the content and then I have a um, we have a staff of trainers um, here at the university who um, can be called upon to um, provide further, uh, more detailed training in the, in the different tools with uh, Premier Pro. And um, as part of our investment with Creative Cloud, we established what's called a, uh, uh, the Adobe Digital Studio. It's located in our library, and it's a um, it's a space where students can come in and we have interns working there um, who have been Adobe certified on various products, so they can answer questions from students. Uh, faculty can also go there if they want to, but they can also then reach out to our dedicated training staff who will then uh, come and help them out. So uh, hmm. I, don't, I don't spend class time training students unless we have a problem that needs to be solved. That is the short answer to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how much work have you guys been doing, you know, like a lot of the media tools using Spark or video tools, uh, have you guys been doing any experimentation with, say, the mobile app tools, like using the phone app or the digital publishing suite, or um, you know, where the output is a mobile app, per se? Right, right. So the first course that I talked about, the uh, technical communication course, um, was designed uh, as, in a, as a prototype, an experiment, but it's designed to be completely um, delivered uh, on mobile and for students to do all their coursework and all their readings and all the work that they need to do uh, on their mobile device. Um, I, in, this, in this version of it, I use the Adobe Spark um, both page and video. Um, and the reason why I didn't incorporate any of the more advanced sort of uh, digital tools, I mean the apps, is that some of them are not available for Android or Windows phones yet, so um, I, you, as an educator, you need to be aware of what your students are uh, have access to, and, and I didn't want to design a course that only iPhone or iOS users could take. So, um, and, and in fact, 
by using Spark, um, those who don't have a smartphone, which believe it or not, there are people out there who don't have a good smartphone these days, um, they can use um, the HTML5 version of Spark, which produces the same great results and it's also easy to use, but they can use it on a, any computer, laptop, or desktop, or you know, anything they have. Yeah, you mentioned the students. What has been their reaction to this approach to the, the media courses, English courses, et cetera, using more of this, this digital media stuff? Has it been generally re, uh, receptive? Has it been, what have you heard from students? Uh, um, a lot of, you know, students are like everybody else. Change is not an easy thing to sell. And uh, <laughs> I, I feel like uh, they come in, and if you give them what, what they, um, what they expect, then uh, they'll be satisfied. But if you raise the stakes and give them something that they didn't expect, a lot of them will rise to that occasion. And um, I know that when they, um, the students that did this mobile course in technical communication, um, I had a had a couple of them who, before the course, emailed me and were quite concerned about the fact that they didn't know much about technology, and I. And I tried to reassure them that this is not a course about technology. This is a course about technical communication and digital rhetoric. Uh, we're going to use technology as a way of uh, practicing that and putting it into practice uh, and thereby learning about it. And so I try to lower the uh, threshold for entering that area. And um, as I mentioned, another example, the young woman, um, Megan Glass, who, who uh, after having struggled through Premiere Pro for a couple of weeks, all of a sudden realized that these are the same. This is the same tools that uh, producers in video or for film folks in Hollywood are using. And to her, that was like a real moment of um, empowerment. She realized that you know I have at my disposal not the training tools to have the real thing. And so the question is, what am I going to do with it? And that was really inspiring to her. So I feel like, to me, that, that just shows that um, students are incredibly capable of adapting to new things. But if you don't challenge them, they'll be happy to do the same old, uh, same old, same old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you feel that some that the, the direction that, that this is headed more is towards more like a, say like the DS one oh six experiment? Are you familiar with that one? The digital storytelling no. this class. It comes out of the University of Mary, uh, Mary Washington. Uh, started back in twenty ten or so, and it's been this evolutionary uh, course that's been all about digital media and the role of the storyteller and the role of the creator, uh, which you mentioned in the talk there about how everyone and every student should be makers and the idea of having that personal uh, identity online and having a place to put your creations, you know, like using Behance from Adobe or other tools to have um, a way to create an identity and share and stories uh, and your, your sort of thought and your understanding through uh, media. Uh, and it's a really interesting experiment that's been going on there that, uh, that sort of reminds me of what you're doing is the same idea that it's about um, helping those students overcome uh, those challenges, but then becoming empowered with those tools to do that kind of analysis, to do that kind of, like you said, transmedia of understanding and of application of that knowledge in different formats is really key. Um, yeah. yeah. yeah it, it, it's along the very same lines, and I, you know, I, I think um, I mentioned at the end of the talk uh, the, the role of Behance here. Uh, I really can't say enough good things about the effect that uh, that portfolio system has. It, it's not designed, it was never designed to be used for, for this purpose. It, it was originally designed as a way for, I guess, photographers um, to share mm -hmm. their, uh, their photos with other photographers. And then, so what we're doing is we're kind of socially constructing a new um, use for the system. and, and uh, but for the students to have the ability to get their work showcased to a real-world audience really inspires them to uh, to do their very best. I, I, I see it again and again. Uh, if, if 
their work end up in my drawer with a grade on it, they'll do just enough to get that grade. Mm -hmm. And uh, but if they are uh, going to show this to their peers, family, friends, and so on, and and and, uh, and they know that this is something that's going to go into their electronic portfolio when they leave here, uh, they really put in a lot of effort into it. And they, they take pride in it. And when they take pride in it, they take ownership in their learning process. And that, I feel like, is one thing that we're uh, sorely missing for a lot of students who couldn't care less about a lot of the things they're supposed to learn. Yeah, that's true. Oh, it looks like Beatrice asked a great question here. How do you bridge that gap of Adobe mobile apps that are OS specific? You know, like obviously some of those apps uh, right now, Adobe's only got them on iOS or Apple devices, um, and not yet on Android. Has that been a challenge for folks, or right? That is the big uh, problem with mobile right now. And whenever I talk to uh, folks from Adobe, I point that out that I, I think mobile is the future. Um, I think for not just content consumption, but increasingly content creation. Uh, but right now, uh, the big holdback is that it is currently mostly iOS uh, specific. So to answer your question, Beatrice, I feel that that's why I chose to use uh, Spark for this uh, technical communication course, because uh, Spark is also available uh, on the web. And so a student uh, uh, if a student don't have an iPhone, can't use the mobile app, then they can log on with their laptop, whether it's Windows, uh, Mac, mm -hmm. Linux, whatever have you, and uh, run Spark in their web browser. Yeah. So that was the solution to, the, to bridging that gap. Uh, I fully expect that uh, Adobe will uh, port their app, their mobile app, to other platforms. Which means that in the uh, hopefully not too distant future, uh, this shouldn't be a problem. But but right now it is a, it is a deterrent. Yeah, that's good to know. I, and I think that Spark's going to definitely take off. I think we're going to see a lot more uses of it because it is such a broader tool set that allows really easy digital production. All right. Well, I think that wraps up um, all my questions as well. Um, so I think we're going to wrap up this webinar. You can, of course, always continue the conversation on the Adobe Education Exchange, uh, a free professional learning community with discussions, resources, courses, and workshops about enhancing the process and practice of teaching with digital creativity tools. Visit edx.adobe.com today for that uh, free community. The recording of this webinar will be saved to the Adobe Education YouTube channel, where you can find recordings of previous webinars in this series. A link to the recording will be posted to the Adobe Education Exchange next week. And I think with that, uh, thank you for your time, everyone. Thank you, Jan, again for being our presenter and sharing more about uh, digital uh, creativity and the mobile learning aspects of it in higher education. Thank you. Thanks for, ha thanks for having me, and uh, thanks for being here, everybody. Yeah. Have a good day. You too.